Hello, my name is Darren Bell. I'm going to here to walk you through the Chapter 13 help video for Principles of Financial Accounting. Chapter 13 is about corporate accounting. So we're going to walk you through uh, a few issues here. One is just issuing stock as a corporation. What does that look like? What accounts does it impact? And then also corporate equity balances. So what balances, what, what accounts do we have and how do balances change over time? And then finally, we'll do a, a little exercise on uh, ish, the issuance of dividends and how that looks when you have common stock and preferred stock and when your preferred stock is cumulative versus non-cumulative. So let's get going. Well, the first one that we have here is just issuance of stock. So this is going to be the simple uh, kind of start here for us. Uh, number one, so we have four journal entries that we're doing here. There we go. So the first one here is we are issuing 2,000 shares of $10 par value common stock for $25,000 cash. So I'm just going to line out real quick how this looks. So our debit is going to be to cash, right? That's what we're getting. So whatever we're getting for our stock typically is going to be the debit. So in this case, we're getting cash, right? And so that's one of the main purposes of issuing stock is to get that extra cash so we can have working capital, so we can grow the business and, and run the business. So that's going to be our debit is going to be cash. Typically when cash is, uh, is in these transactions, we're receiving cash for the issuance of stock. Now, uh, what we're going to do here is we are also going to have our stock accounts right so in this case it's going to be ten dollar par value common stock so it's going to be par value common stock and what we want to do is we want to look at those accounts and we want to say okay we have these here let's do some quick math here for example let's say we we get ten dollars per share times 2,000 shares. Well, that's not equal to the cash that we received. And so the way it works is, is this is what our par value or the, the stock will, uh, the entry will be on the credit side for our $10 par value common stock, $20,000, not 24,000. And so the extra $4,000 is going to be to our uh, our paid in capital in excess and so of common stock. So our paid in capital in excess account is going to take that extra amount uh, for anything that we received that's over and above uh, our common stock, our stated value, uh, any of those items that uh, we have. So uh, number two, we're going to issue again, this is a thousand shares of no par common stock. So we don't, this does not have par. So we don't have to worry about that extra um, paid in capital in excess because there is no par value. So it's it's worth whatever is paid for it. In this case, our promoters, somebody is coming and helping us start the business and we are paying them uh, for their services and uh, that payment will be in stock. So we're not paying them cash. We are trying to reserve cash here. Instead, we're saying, hey, you want to be a part owner in the co company and you can have stock. There's no par, but it does have stated value. So we're going to treat that just like the par value. So it'll be $6 uh, stated value, a uh, 1,000 shares. So what's that? That's $6,000. Everything extra is going to be um, paid in capital in excess. It's, this isn't necessarily paid in, but it's, it's basically... Uh, that's the account we're going to use. And so um, anything extra beyond the $6,000. So there'll be a $6,000 credit. There will be a $50,000 credit to pay in excess. Our debit, in this case, what do we get? Well, we get services. Uh, otherwise, we would have had to pay for them. It's like an expense. So this is organization expense. That's our debit. That's our debit for $56,000. So um, number three... All of these are available at the end of the chapter. Just so you know, at the end of the chapter, 
there, at the end of each chapter in the book, there's a little section that's called the cheat sheet. Uh, typically, there's going to be some journal entries lined out uh, with real brief yet um, concise explanation of what those journal entries for are for, and they'll help you kind of line out what accounts and things, the format you're going to need for these different things. Super useful. Okay, so next one, this one is no par and no stated value, so we're not going to have any paid in excess there. So this is the one, number three is no paid in excess. Just like the one before, our debit is going to be to that organizational expense. Our credit is going to be to our um, uh, our common stock, no par value, no stated value. Um, so it's just two entries there, debit and a credit, one, one, and one. Uh, here, number four, we have got cash again. So it's going to be kind of like number one. Debit is going to be to cash, of course. Our credit in this case is going to be to our par value, preferred stock in this case, not common stock. And then we do, we may have some paid in excess on that. Uh, make sure to tag the preferred stock, the correct paid in excess on that to get the right one. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. These are these are uh, con these are kind of the same thing, right? So we're going to be doing those things. Yep, this is the same thing. So this is uh, basically a duplicate here. So that was an error on my part. So duplicate there, and then we're going to move on to our next one. This one is going to be. Uh, another journal entry where we're going to issue some stock and we are receiving uh, land uh, and a building for that stock. Okay, so our debits are, are what we're getting, right? So in the case of cash, we're going to be uh, debiting the cash. In this case, we're going to be debiting the land, we're going to be debiting the building. Um, we're going to be crediting our par value for the amount of 9 times 28,000. And then we will also have paid in excess. So there's going to be an extra credit. So that's going to be our credits, our, our common stock, and then our paid in excess will be our credits. All right, so hopefully this helps. If you have any extra questions, definitely reach out to me, send me an email, or call me up. Uh, so we're going to do equity balances here. So the way this works is uh, it gives us the beginning balances that we have in equity at the end of September. So it's September 30. These are our ending balances for common stock, $10 par value, our paid in capital in excess. Uh, so we're familiar with those now, right? Those are going to be uh, from issuing stock. Those two are established. Then now we have retained earnings. So retained earnings is actually where we close everything to uh, just like in the uh, sole proprietorship and the partnership we're closing accounts into those uh, capital accounts uh, for those companies for a corporation we're going to be closing everything into this retained earnings is what is what's going to happen at the end of the year so this is our retained earnings it's it just accumulates our retains earnings and it also has losses that are set against it as well depending on if the year is a loss so that's what that balance is important thing about retained earnings so this is typically what we look at and this is where when we issue our dividends this is uh, an account that's reduced right so as soon as we as soon as we declare dividends retained earnings is reduced and we have a dividends payable the dividend, of course, as we pay it, if it's a cash dividend, the, the next step then is to reduce the payable by actually paying cash out to our dividend holder or our stockholders in the form of a dividend. So that's what retained earnings is. There's, there's a bit more in there, but that's the basics. So now we also have on here, we have all these transactions happening throughout the month. So th those are going to be transactions happening. And what we're going to do here is we are going to line out the balances and how they're impacted as we go through these transactions. Um, and so let's go ahead and bring up our table. So this is our table that we're going to be using. So our table is going to start off here. And we have, of course, the beginning balances of September, or the ending balances of September are really our beginning balances October 1st, when we start, first start out. Our first... Um, 
transaction is we are going to declare some dividends. So right off the get-go, we are declaring dividends, which, uh, like I said before, remember, this is going to reduce our retained earnings, right? So this is going to reduce our retained earnings. So something to look at here, that October 1st one is going to impact this negatively, right? So we're going to subtract from retained earnings, and then we're going to uh, have our paid in, uh, let's see here, there we go. So nothing else is going to be impacted. None of, none of these other, uh, so th these are going to be the same. So it'll just go through. This will be the same. Uh, it'll be the same balance and uh, same balance here. So we're just going to bring those across. Keep them going. This one's going to be reduced because uh, that's where the dividend is going to, basically uh, the, the dividend paid is going to come out of our retained earnings. So the next one, October 25th, is going to be common dividend payable and cash. And so that one, all of these are going to be the same going through here. There is not going to be any any change, right? We're not paying the dividend in common stock or else that would change. Uh, and so this is going to be the same. That's going to be the same as uh, this one, this one's just going to carry over, right? So October 31st, this one's going to be retained earnings, common stock dividends distributable, and then paid in capital in excess of uh, our, for this is for our common stock dividend. And so on this one, we are going to not have any extra common stock yet. It's distributable, but it's, um, it hasn't been distributed, right? So that's not going to be impacted. This one's going to be added on to, right? So a credit will add on to these, and we will also, uh, on this one, it's going to be subtracted from on the retained earning side, right? Um, and so those are going to be our, our changes. Now, for November 5th, this is when we actually distribute our common stock dividend. So common stock dividend on this one, common stock dividend is going to be, uh, we issue more common stock. So instead of paying cash, we're actually going to issue our stockholders more stock. And so that means our common stock is going to go up and our um, distributable, whoop, I missed this one. That one's going to be added to last time, right? Distributable. That one's going to be subtracted. So this one's basically going to zero out there. Uh, it's distributable and then it'll zero out. Uh, this next one is going to be the same as before. So we're going to go ahead and roll over same, right? These are going to keep going. And then the very last one down here at the bottom is going to be the same. All right, so uh, we got a few more here. December 1st, we're going to have a memo, change the title of the common stock account to reflect the new par value of $4. Uh, well, that's not going to do anything to our balances, right? So we're just going to have the same rollover. All we're, all we're going to do is just update, basically, in our accounting system, that account name. So they're going to be the same. And then um, on the very last one here, this is going to be income summary retained earnings. So we're going to get more. Uh, this is the end of the year. And so we're closing our income, uh, right? Revenues minus expenses. We're closing that into retained earnings. So what that's going to look like here, uh, it's not going to do anything to our common stock. So that'll be the same nor will it do anything to our paid in excess. These two are only really impacted if we have more or less stock. If we issue stock with a dividend or we sell stock, um, the very last one here, of course, this is going to be added to. So that's where it's going to be added to there. So that kind of tells you the plus and minuses of this as you drag it across. So hopefully that helps you. Again, if you have any questions, let me know. So this last one, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about dividends distributable. Uh, or, yeah, distributed, right? So um, let me pull this up real quick here. This should be, so these these that are on here, these are called Tableau uh, problem sets is what they are. 
they are going to be the same across everybody, but I'm going to kind of give you some hints on how to do this and some of the tricks on how to fill this out to make it work for you. Okay, so what we've got down here is we've got a table, and we're, we're assuming that we have non-cumulative right here, right? So this one right here, non-cumulative uh, preferred stock. So that's going to be important. So I'm going to kind of walk you through this real quick. So the par value per preferred share is going to be up here. Par value per share right there. That's our par value per preferred share. So that's going to be your par value right there. You're going to grab that and put it down in here. right? Your dividend rate is going to be up here. That's going to be this right here. That's our dividend rate. So you're going to grab that. You're going to put that in the next one up top. The whole goal of this row across the top is to calculate the preferred dividend, uh, the annual preferred dividend. So you're going to multiply those across. So par value per, per, per preferred share times the dividend rate equals the dividend per preferred share. So again, multiply those first two. Of course, 6% is 0 0.06. Remember that uh, when you put it into your calculator. Um, and that will give us the dividend per preferred share. Now, the next thing you're going to look at is you got to go find how many preferred shares do we have. And that's going to be right in this little table here. So we're going to grab that number, 70,000, and we're going to plug that into number of preferred shares. So if we have, if we know what our per share dividend is, we multiply it up by our number of shares. We're going to do multiply those last two that will give us our very last one, right? Preferred dividend. So that's going to be the multipl multiplication of these uh, two here will give us the last one. Okay, we're going to use that as we go forward. So the idea is this. Um, we have year one that comes up and it looks like we have a cash dividend paid right here, $25,000. Okay, so depending on what our dividend, preferred dividend is, set from this first line, that dividend that's paid may cover it or it may not. If we are doing this first one, which is non-cumulative, it doesn't matter if it covers it, covers it or not. We only get what's paid. So the, the amount paid to preferred stock will only be our $25,000. That's it. Uh, if the preferred stock gets everything, then the common stock, of course, will get nothing. Uh, dividend in arrears, we're going to talk about this and this will we'll use for our next tab over. Not now, but we'll use it for our next tab over. Uh, for non-cumulative, there is no dividend in arrears. Meaning that if they don't pay us everything they owe us from this preferred dividend that we've calculated up here, they don't have the, the company doesn't have to uh, pay it later. Right? Dividend arrears means basically they owe us those dividends in the future. Uh, Non-cumulative doesn't have those. So dividend and arrears for this whole deal all the way down the column, we'll, we'll just leave them blank. There's not going to be any of them. Okay, so the next one we're going to go on to, we're going to do the same thing that we did in year two. We're going to say, okay, if the preferred dividend is uh, larger than what they're paying us, we only get what they pay us. Right, so, so preferred dividend again will get the total amount. Common stock will get nothing. Okay, so now finally in year three, we're getting some uh, more serious dividends here. So this is where the, the common stock gets to play here. So what we get is in year three, we're looking and we say two, 210,000. Is the preferred dividend bigger or smaller than, than 210,000? It's gonna be smaller. Right, so we only get right here paid to preferred. We only get what the preferred dividend is. No more, no less. We just get that amount. If they pay us enough to cover it, it covers it. Everything else will go on to the preferred stock. So that two hundred ten thousand minus the preferred dividend that's paid out to preferred stockholders equals what's left for the common shareholders. They're second in line. That's why preferred stock is preferred because preferred stock gets to stand in line first. 
get paid first. Uh, and in some cases, they're on, the only ones that get paid. So that's great to be for preferred stock. Year four, uh, we're gonna do just like we did in year three. We're gonna pay the preferred dividends, what they're owed up here under the preferred dividend. And then we're gonna pay the common stock the leftovers, what's left of the 360,000. So that's what's going to be done here in 1A. So that's non-cumulative. Now we're flipping over here to cumulative. We just changed this, this word right here just changed up on this one, 1B. And so this first row that we're going to do, exact same to calculate the preferred dividend. Exact same data, right? We'll just come up with, fill that out again so we get our preferred dividend. And now we're marching along here. We go year one. Our preferred dividend up here does not is larger than the cash dividend paid. So that means we get the cash dividend paid. We'll get the twenty-five thousand, right? Common stock will get nothing because we got it, it all paid to us. And over here in dividends and arrears, what's going to happen is whatever the dividend or preferred dividend is up here, we're going to subtract what we got paid, and that will be the rest that they owe us. And we'll just uh, keep, that's why it's called cumulative. And we'll get, we're going to keep uh, accumulating that dividend in arrears until it's finally paid. So it's like an account that they owe us. Um, and so they don't have to pay us this year. It's going to be future years. Whenever they issue a dividend, we're going to uh, say, hey, we have a dividend in arrears. You have to pay us back before you even pay common stock. So that's going to be year two. Uh, we're going to do the same thing. If 30000 is not enough, which I'm pretty sure that's not enough to cover our preferred dividend up here that we calculated, then common stockholder again gets zero. And then we uh, take our preferred dividend that they owe us minus the 30000 That will tell us how much they dividend in arrears were uh, accumulated or were uh, owed in year two. We add that to year one. Uh, dividend in arrears and that will be the number we put here on year two. So year two will be what they owed us from year one will roll over it will accumulate with year two. So now we finally get down here to year three and we have quite a good cash dividend that's paid out here. So what's going to happen is we're going to get in this uh, year paid to our preferred dividend we're going to get the preferred dividend from up here. We'll get that much. Plus, if there's enough, right? If this 210,000 will cover it, we will get paid our dividend in arrears that's gonna be here in year that we've accumulated to year two, right? So that those numbers added up, whatever accumulated dividend is here in year two, plus the yearly preferred dividend amount that's owed is gonna be year three paid to preferred dividends. So it'll be a larger number, right? It'll be larger than just the preferred dividend amount owed. It will be um, dividend arrears and preferred dividend added up. 210,000 minus that amount that was paid will be whatever the common stockholders get. So they get a they get a you know a smaller amount in year three because uh, than in the first example because we got dividend arrears that have to be paid first. So common stock uh, does get paid a bit here. Year four, well, now there's no dividend in arrears. The dividend in arrears in year three were zeroed, so it should be zero here for year three. It's zeroed out, it got paid. And year four, there's plenty of dividends, uh, cash dividends paid, so now preferred stock is back to getting just their preferred dividend amount. And then common stockholders get the uh, leftovers of the 360,000. So that really, that last line will be the same as the last line in 1A in that last tab, right? They're going to be the same. The, the ones that are different are going to be all these years building up, doing dividend and arrears. So. Uh, and then at the end, you also close with a zero balance there. No dividend and arrears, so that's great. All right, we're moving on here. So uh, you, you can answer these questions on your own, right? Definitely, would potential investors favor cumulative or non-cumulative? Um, should be a, a no-brainer, right? They definitely like the cumulative because it, it uh, will get them more money in the end, for sure, right? Um, uh, 
why would this company want to issue preferred stock instead of common stock? So uh, I'll let you select an answer there. And so think about those options. And then why might an investor prefer Alta's preferred stock over its common stock? So I'll let you select those. So definitely preferred stock has its ups and downs. It's not, you know, it, in some cases it's not the best. In some cases it is, right? It just depends on what you prefer and what you value on there. So, all right, I hope this helps, and um, we will uh, see you. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or call me, and uh, have a good day. See you later.